Brown. I am, I am the car seat manufacturer representative of the National Child Passenger Safety Board and Community Engagement Co-Chair. Um, having worked in juvenile products industry since 2007, specifically in the car seat industry, um, I bring season experience of the manufacturing and development process to the board as the child seat manufacturer representative. Prior to working in the juvenile industry, I was a vehicle seat engineer for more than eight years at Lear Corporation working on projects for Ford and Mazda. Um, I have an in-depth understanding of a vehicle's dynamics in a crash condition, how the body reacts in crash situations. However, um, more importantly, joining us today is Denise Donaldson, who is the owner of Safe Ride News Publications, which publishes educational materials for the child passenger safety field, including the Safe Ride News, Safe Ride News newsletter, the Latch Manual, and the School Bus Safety Handbook. In 1996, she founded a program that provides checkup events and community classes through Seattle area hospitals, which she continues to run to this day. She has been a CPST instructor since 1998 and is a current member of the National CPS Board serving as a child passenger safety advocate, though she is not representing the board today. We have planned time to answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please answer your questions, enter your questions rather in the Q&A box. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but sorry, Denise, before we get going, um, I just wanna just do, there we go. Um, did you want, I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was after. You can go ahead and do your slide there if you like. Nope, go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so as a reminder, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar if you are operating a motor vehicle. The webinar will, will be recorded and you can listen to the recording when you safely arrive at your destination. The recording will be posted to cpsboard.org forward slash recertification within the next one to two business days. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one CEU. In order to earn the CEU, attendance on this webinar is required for at least 45 minutes. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. And now, um, I mentioned the questions. I'm going to hand it off to Denise. <laughs> thanks, Daniela. Appreciate it. So um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, I at Last fall at the auto show, I really noted how much the new vehicle trends had changed the way we do CPS in vehicles. And so I put together a uh, presentation that I was doing earlier this year at various conferences talking about new trends. And when I did those, a couple of people said, well, that's great, Denise, but what about old cars? And it's like, great idea. You know, if there's all this new stuff, that means we're kind of leaving behind the old type of cars, but we all know that cars don't actually all go away. So it's a good idea to revisit some of those techniques we use in old cars. So I want to go over kind of what makes an old car old from CPS terms. Uh, what are those various features? And then kind of revisit some of what I figure are kind of like our lost arts, the things we used to do a lot and we maybe don't do so often. So we're, we don't have as much practice using lap only belts or belt shorteners or retrofitting tether anchors. So I'll go through those sorts of things as well as of course, provide you with some resources that you can use. So if you were tuning in to find out about these old cars, I am sorry to disappoint you. It's not gonna be the classic cars, it's going to be about these old cars, these ones that really do roll into our check stations, which might be the person's primary vehicle, or it could be their backup vehicle, or maybe even a grandparent's car, or nanny's car, something like that. Uh, but it's the car that they have that a child will ride in all the time or sometimes. Uh, and I've had some that it's maybe even a sentimental vehicle where maybe it's not the primary one, and maybe they're even deciding whether they're going to keep it or not provided they can make it work as a backup car for the child. So um, in, in either case, you're gonna need to figure out how to make this car safe for the child. Because while I don't see these vehicles as much as I used to, and it's pretty rare in some cases to see some of the things I'm gonna be talking about today, 
what's really important and key in all of this is if a child is riding in this older vehicle, that means that's a car that doesn't have all the safety bells and whistles that we have in vehicles today. But we do have the safest types of car seats that we have today that we can use properly in that car to make that vehicle environment so much safer for that child. So while they are riding in a car seat, we can make this car as safe as it can possibly be as long as we know what we're doing. So like I mentioned, we don't see those cars nearly as much anymore. And it, you're not wrong in, in observing that, um, though, that cars are getting older on the road today. And so right as I was preparing this back at the beginning of the year, uh, there's an organization that does an annual survey of the age of cars. And you can really see, it's pretty clear that our, our fleet of vehicles out on the road is aging, uh, even in the last 10 years. Uh, the age of the vehicles have gone way up, especially in terms of the passenger cars. So you can see that cars today might be 13, uh, 12 or 13 years old, and that's that's on average. That's not the oldest, of course, but by average. So, but that's the whole, all the cars out there. So I also wanted to think about, well, what about the cars that carry kids? What do I have available that I can look into to learn that? And so I turned to the uh, carseatcheckform.org, which is that NDCF or digital check form site, where they're collecting all that digital information that we're use, we're putting into the check form and, and populating this cool dashboard. I hope you've all checked that out at carseatcheckform.org. Uh, when I did this, you can see I've put a box around data, which is where you can find it once you've logged in on your account. But now they've just recently changed it. So even from before you log in, you can actually go to this dashboard. So I certainly would encourage people to do that. And then once you're there, you can click on vehicle information. That's what I used here to get this lovely um, printout or um, histogram on all the different years of the cars that were checked. And so this falls out kind of how I would expect, right? It's definitely we are seeing at car seat checks much newer vehicles and fewer and fewer of the older ones, right? But as you can see here, we have almost 90,000 checks in there. So there's a lot of car seat checks. It's not all the checks. Not everyone's using the NDCF yet. I hope that we will see more and more people using it. But there is a pretty good amount of checks on there. And so we're starting to see a pretty good representation of what's real. And I, one thing that I kind of love is seeing this little dip here, back when we had that auto industry crisis and the bailout, there were fewer cars. And it, this is even getting represented in our um, otherwise kind of sort of bell-shaped curve. Um, and because these are all really crammed together pretty closely, I want to point out if we were on the website, you could hover over any of these bars like I did for 1990 right here, and you can see the number. Um, so you don't even have to just estimate, but you can see the actual number for each one. So this is a, just one of the very many things that are really useful on this dashboard. And so from this, I could see just by looking at the tallest bar, the mode or the one that we see most of is model year 2018. But if you do um, some mathematical uh, work on the numbers like I did, uh, it turns out that the median, or in other words, when there's as many before as there are after, that's a 2013. And the, and the mean or average is actually 2012. So I think that calculation is kind of interesting because it doesn't really look like that from looking at the way this curve goes, but the, the car that is the average is really about 10 years old for us. But again, that's average because you know clearly we do still see these others. And just because those are fewer doesn't make them again, less important. In fact, counting up the ones that are two th year 2000 and earlier, there's over 2000 checks just in these NDCF. And we know other people who aren't using NDCF are also checking those cars. So all that by way of saying that we really are seeing these cars out there. They might not be the most common and that actually makes it even more important that we do this kind of work to remind ourselves about them because when they're out there and we don't see them often, then we sometimes kind of forget. And the thing about cars is they don't expire. So you can see there's all sorts of aspects to cars 
that are um, have been in our curriculum over the years, and some of them have kind of moved their way out because we don't actually see them as often anymore. So some of you that are on this uh, presentation today are going to see things as we go through that you're like, oh yeah, I totally recognize that, and oh yeah, that we we dealt with that a lot. And then others of you, maybe if you're newer tech, you may have never seen something like this, but that doesn't mean either one of us. Uh, if we've seen it a lot in the past or we've never seen it, we're, or maybe we only did it in cert class, um, we're probably getting rusty at some of these things. So the good opportunity to think these things through and practice. Before I get into some of those vehicle details, I also want to talk a little bit about recalls, right? Because whether it's an older car or a newer car, recalls are a big important problem. We have 52 over 52, I'm sorry, over 53 million vehicles with open recalls on the road. So that's not just recalled vehicles, but ones that are open, haven't been fixed. And the thing about recalls that we have to remember is they are safety recalls. So they're not done just, you know, because it's broken or it's going to cost something to fix. It's because it could cause a safety issue. And this page, sorry, this page here to the left is just uh, an email I got. I get a couple of these a week because I've signed up any citizen in the country can sign up to be notified of recalls. Not every citizen needs to, but CPSTs might be interested in this because some of these have to do with safety uh, directly for children. But whether it's about kids or if it's just a general, you know, the car breaks and or doesn't uh, operate like it should on the road, uh, it's it uh, either directly or indirectly will affect children. And so people should be checking for recalls and they can do that at nitsa.gov by entering their VIN or at NSC's check to protect by entering the VIN or the license plate number. So just to make that clear, we do have two ways now that we can check and it's either with nitsa.gov or check to protect. Um, if you're looking at this nitsa.gov one on the left here, it's showing that you're gonna enter the VIN, which we most of us know we can look through the um, windshield here and find the VIN on that little metal plate. But what this picture here is trying to show is that if you go, if you open the car door, either on the door jam here or on the edge of the door, you're going to find a required door jam sticker or VIN placard that's also going to be a place to find the VIN. And the reason I point that out for this presentation is, besides the fact that it's a little bit easier to read than going down through the window, it's always going to tell you when the car was made. And so this one was made in September 21. So it's a model 20, year 22. And this one is uh, September of 18. So it's a model year 19. And so if you're looking at an older car, that's one way because a lot of times the owner's manual might be long gone and you're not even sure. And boy, it's hard to remember what year that car was. We can always look at this placard and find out what it is actually the year for that vehicle. So to um, go back to our places to check for recalls, I do like to point out, as I mentioned, that besides the VIN, you can use just a license plate, the, the state and the license plate number on check to protect. So I really like using that resource because that's a much shorter number that I can get without having to even get inside someone's car to help them look for recalls. Now, um, of course, recalls, like I said, are important for all vehicles, but why do I mention them in this particular presentation? Well, here's a question for you. If I was in, with you together, we would kind of work this through, but question, think to yourself, is there a time limit on vehicle recalls? So I've already mentioned that vehicles don't expire. They last forever, right? And, well, <laughs> they last till they break down and they do go away eventually, but technically speaking, there's no expiration date. But what about the recall on the car? Well, technically, yes, there is a recall um, time period because even though that, that unrepaired safety defect would last the lifetime of the vehicle, the manufacturers are only required to support the fixes for them for 15 years. And that sounds like a long time, I know, but remember, we're talking that there are a lot of cars out there older than 15 years. So if you go to the NHTSA.gov site and you, the very first thing, even before you put in the VIN, it's going to tell you it's going to list for you any unrepaired vehicle, um, vehicles affected by a recall for the past 15 calendar years. And it says underneath further, things that won't show are going to be ones more than 15 years, except where the manufacturer offers more coverage. So that's 
always a, a thing they can do voluntarily, but they are not obligated to after 15 years. So just another reason to remind people that it is very important to follow up on their recalls and do it now while it's um, on their mind and while the car is newer and while the, the manufacturer still has to follow up on the fix. Doesn't mean that older cars and the owner shouldn't know about a recall, but they can't count on a fix after 15 years to be free anyway. Okay, so um, let's transition to kind of looking in a car. And it kind of landed in my lap as I was preparing this presentation that someone contacted me wanting to know how to safely transport their grandchild in a 1990 Mercedes-Benz E-Series vehicle, which I looked up online. This isn't her car, but I looked one up online and it looks a bit like this. I also found when I was looking this up that this is a very popular vehicle that lasts a long time when people own one. It's a kind of a collector car. And, and even in the uh, evolution of the E-Series, her particular vehicle, while it might seem old to us, you know, is one of the more modern looking ones and uh, she was still using it. Well, the things that we need to consider about that 1990 Mercedes-Benz, I'm not in person with her, by the way, she contacts me by email. And so I have to think, what do I know already about her vehicle and what should I expect about it? Now, naturally, I want to ask questions. I want to look, you know, get pictures if I can, or even meet in person. But even before I do that, I know a bunch of things. I know because it's 1990, it's after 1989, which was the year that lap and shoulder belts were required in the outboard position. So that's a that's the thing to note is that I will expect to see those lap and shoulder belts there. But it's before a lot of other things, right, that changed the way cars work for car seats. It's it's before lockability came in in 1996. It's before tether anchors were required and certainly before latch and I say pre 2001 because we know to we think of 2003 that's when all cars had to but some of them were transitioning it was a phase in period of time so but certainly before 2001 we can know for sure there really wasn't any latch and it's of course way before 2008 when a center rear lap and shoulder belt was required when we still had just a lap belt in the middle in most vehicles. So these are things I can kind of guess about that car. Also, because it was made in the 90s, I can figure that tether anchor retrofitting while a factory installed one wasn't required yet. It's definitely possible to retrofit in the 90s. So I would look into that. And also it's possible it has automatic seat belts. Okay, so in the rest of this presentation, we'll talk about seat belts and tethering in particular, because in older cars, we didn't have the lower anchors, right? So starting off, uh, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but automatic seat belts used to be a thing, right? So uh, for a big long time, from the mid 70s to the mid 90s, uh, it was a very interesting era. Uh, people would not buckle up. Uh, we were reluctant to get our laws in place to require them to buckle up. We hadn't tried that out. And it's kind of hard to imagine, but basically we, it was such a bad situation that we had to kind of come up with some sort of passive type of restraint idea. And so we had these two competing notions. We would have airbags or we maybe could have automatic seatbelts. And the government was saying, pushing things and the automotive industry was pushing back the other way. And for a period of time, it was a push and pull between airbags or automatic seat belts. And ultimately, we all know what, what happened. We tried out the automatic seat belts for a, short, a period of time, period of years. And ultimately, we got regulations and settled on it being airbags that we would have. And, and then beyond that, we determined that they had to work supplementally. They weren't going to replace seatbelts. But for this era where automatic seatbelts are in place, you can see, and this is a magazine advertisement where Volkswagen was actually advertising this type of a belt and saying that it was going to be required in all vehicles by a certain date, which didn't actually come to pass but it did, um, it was an option between airbags and, and the seat belts during that period of time. Um, and I say here, it's larger, largely irrelevant to CPS today for a couple of reasons. One is this is only gonna be in those much older cars. The last one went into a car in like 96. So it's, it's much older cars, but it's also, the, by today, we're mostly putting kids in the back seat. Back then we were seeing a lot more kids in the front seat. Um, so it's these are only in the front seat, never in the back. And so while the original curriculum and the next versions of it included talking about this, because we did back then have 
these cards more common and we also had kids in the front seat more often, uh, it was removed long ago from our curriculum. So we don't talk about it as much today, but I will just quickly you know, point out they were two basic types. Some were attached to the door and some were only the shoulder part attached to the door and the, sh and the lap portion was on a retractor and you had to put it on. Uh, but either way, the important thing to consider is even though that would kind of freak you out to see this um, and think, oh my goodness, Please remember that CPS fundamentals still apply. So despite the fact they look weird, it would still be a matter of determining how that lap belt can be used to stay locked all the time to hold a, a child seat in place. And of course, whenever possible, we're not gonna use this, we're gonna put the child in the back. So getting to the more common situations where we really frequently could see this happen, uh, I searched online and found a couple pictures of this E-class Mercedes. Here's one from 1990, just like, the, you know, so I would have an idea of what it would look like. And then I just pulled up one from the more recent time to kind of see how they compare. And you can see, you know, they're uh, at first glance, they're somewhat similar. If you look closely, there are differences, but um, but it's not tremendously un unusual. And and in, in some ways, you could imagine some situations where the older one might even be easier than the newer one for installation. You just need to know what you're, what you're doing and what the, the parts of the car are. One thing to look at, of course, is that uh, latch plate itself. I can see that in the picture. And just by looking at it, I can see it's a non-locking latch plate, meaning it's free sliding. It has the two, two uh, slot. It's a two slotted type, but this part in between doesn't slide or move and pinch anything. So it's not locking. And because of the age of the vehicle, I should not expect that it's a locking retractor either. So what that's going to mean is that either the car seat would need to have a lock off or we're going to have to go and use a locking clip. And so locking clips are still in the curriculum. Uh, might be for some of us, the last time we ever used one was when we were going through the curriculum. Um, and even if it isn't that that isn't the case, a lot of times we aren't in practice using a uh, locking clip. So I'll just point out that there is a job aid for this um, in at the cpsboard.org website under resources and then technician resources. So if you're um, feeling like you're a little rusty on that, you can go check out that job aid. If you, uh, it would probably be a great idea to print this out and have it at your checks so that if you do need to go review it or your techs need to review it, that you'll have it handy. So, um, the other thing to look at is the buckle side of things, and these don't look that unlike what we would see today at all, do they? Uh, but when I look at it, pictures online, um, it's usually when they're trying to sell the car. And if I can get a picture of the back seat, uh, usually they've cleaned it up as much as they can. And so in, what that means is if I look real carefully, um, there is some webbing on this buckle. And you can really see that even though this is tucked up and kind of upright, like we're we, we're kind of used to that now. You can really tell there's there's actually some webbing on the end of it. So that's one of the big things that's different between then and now. And you can see in the in the 19 or the 2022 version that I was comparing before. These look at first like they're the same, but I can tell you in this brand new car, you're going to have a center seat belt. This one is laying down flat in a little holding spot. And then these two outboard buckles are literally just that short, probably on a piece of metal. They may or may not even fold up and down. They are going to be stationary. Whereas I would be willing to bet if I pulled hard on this, there would be underneath that opening a, a length of webbing under there that would pull out. And so uh, again, this isn't necessarily making this a harder installation. It just kind of depends on the matchup with the car seat, but we maybe aren't as familiar anymore with how we would deal with that in, um, in our uh, other vehicles. So we, we just need to be prepared for that. And the reason that comes into play is when it's for the center seat belt, especially because in the center seat belt on those older ones, it's going to be a lap only belt, right? And so when we have a lap only belt, one of our main concerns is to make sure that, well, our, our primary concern is to make sure that this is in a locked position, but it has to do a lot with this length of the webbing. So in this Subaru Legacy, when we install this car seat here, we have two potential problems. One is because of the length of the buckle stock, that's not movable, it's not uh, changeable. Once I tighten it up, I have this hardware all up pretty high. And so we have to worry about, you know, whether or not that 
carrier is going to lock onto the base. And it's pretty easy to find out if that's a problem or not. You put it on there and, and confirm that you have a solid click and it's staying locked and that you can take it back off properly. So in this case, I think it's pretty um, sure that it would be in the way. But the other thing that's real important is the positioning of it to know whether that's in a locked position or if it's in an unlocked position. And that is also very important. And I like this picture because it's in a really modern car seat that has one of our favorite bells and whistles, which is a belt tensioner that's also a lock off. So it, it's holding that. If I tried to test out this seat, it would be nice and tight. But the, here's the problem. We're used to that for our lap and shoulder belts, and that would be no problem. But in this case, this is a false sense of security. If a belt like this, this is the thing that's holding in a crash. If that is in an unlocked position, the lock off is not the way to solve the problem. So I want to talk a little bit more about this so we have a big, better mental picture, because again, sometimes some of these these concepts we haven't looked at in real life unless we happen to come across an older car. So um, over here on the left is um, a lap, a, a demonstration uh, lap belt that is like many that are in actual cars that doesn't have the plastic flange coming all the way over to cover what I call the guts. So I like this one for demonstrating because it shows some from the side view what that bar. So remember that little bar on the inside, the locking bar. Now I can see what happens to it on the side because that's what's important. I'm just holding it loosely here. But in this case, I've pulled on not not the, sh the not the loose end, but on the the lap belt portion of it like it's straining as it's tight around a car seat. And what that does is it pinches this in its channel up against here and holds the belt in place. That's how it locks. So in other words, if it's in that position or even in this upper position in a crash when it slides up into that groove or that channel it's only going to get tighter and tighter whereas when it's tilted like this what ends up happening when we pull or put strain on the lap portion of it is it pulls from the back the the flat side of the the locking bar and it does not slide it up into the channel. It can't, right? Because the channel that wouldn't be the right direction for it to pull then. So when it's tilted, it will loosen and it won't pinch like it needs to, to lock. So it, we need to check that whenever we're in these situations. And this is really hard to take pictures of that really, you know, you have to, you know, test it and, and check it out. But you can see in these pictures that there's a little space here, a little gap that's indicating to me that if I pull that it's just going to slide right through. It's pulling on the long piece of the bar. Whereas in this picture on the right, even though it's kind of hard to tell and it's still sticking up pretty high, but it's coming up just flat enough that it's going to pull upward on that bar, on the bottom of the bar and slide it into the channel in that groove so it will stay tight. So it's a um, something that's not, you have to kind of feel down in there to see if you can get this little triangle here. I like to talk about the triangle, but that's in that locked position. Even that slight bit of turn there means it will stay locked. Okay, now going back to our lost arts, one of those that we talked about a ton back in decade a decade ago was twisting the buckle stock. And we still talk about it today, but if we think about it, we don't do it very often. It's certainly not on newer cars anymore like we used to. If the buckle stock is around four, three, five inches, depending if you have to. Now, you don't do this automatically, but if it comes up and it's in an unlocked position or it's getting in the way of, of putting the car seat on the base, then you can uh, do up to three full twists. That's been tested by the maker of the webbing to be determined to still be a strong enough belt, uh, but um, the buckle should, it should be full twist so that the buckle stays facing away from the car seat. And you can see in these pictures that it comes up alongside the car seat here. And as you twist it down, that twisting when it's this length kind of shortens it up. And so even when it's buckled and the strain is put on it and it kind of pulls up a little bit, it still puts it down into a position where the tension is going to slide that locking plate or locking bar into the groove and keep it holding tight and locked. So um, this trick doesn't work well with a longer bit of webbing. And when I should note that even though uh, the other thing that I 
work on a lot of school buses. We see these on school buses as well, but a lot of times their webbing is way too long for this to work. It just kind of ropes up. But that typical situation in an older car, usually doing, uh, you do as few twists as you need. You don't always need to go straight to three. Um, and then uh, that would usually bring it out of the danger zone of unlocked. And just to summarize then, you want it to, this looks just fine. It's lying flat. It's pinched into this groove. Whereas you have this little bit of opening. If it's too high, then it's not. Okay. Another kind of um, belt that we saw in older cars, uh, we all learned about sewn on latch plates. We still learn about that in our curriculum. But what we don't see as often is when the, the retractor on the lap portion of the belt, whether that's a lap and shoulder belt, like this slide from an older version of the curriculum, or just a lap belt. If the, if the, if the retractor on that lap portion is an ELR, then that's a, an unusual situation that we have to deal with. Well, the best thing to do is to use a different seat that doesn't have this problem. But when you have no other choice than to do this, then uh, you're going to need to do a special technique called belt shortening. And most of us are probably like, oh, yeah, I remember that from certification class. Even in all the years I've been doing this in person, I've only had been involved in a handful of cases where it's been necessary to do this. But the last time I did it was for a family with a BMW, and they were having a third child, and their center seat belt was this type. And um, there was no other choice for them if they were going to transport their kids, uh, but to, to do the belt shortening technique that lops off some of the webbing uh, or all of the webbing that is not needed to make a nice tight installation. And so um, this is former, this looks pretty, <laughs> looks pretty ancient. This is from the revised um, revision in, tw in uh, 2010 of our curriculum. So really not that long ago, but um, there is, uh, it's kind of showing that you're gonna figure out by pulling all the webbing out of the retractor and using this in a very particular way with a very particular clip, which I'll talk more about in a moment, um, and a very particular kind of threading that you would be lopping off. Well, the purpose of this presentation isn't to show you exactly how to do that, but just knowing that when it's a, a sewn on retractor, which sewn on latch plate with an ALR, ELR retracted that won't lock in a, other than in a crash, that you would need to use belt shortening. Um, because that's not in the curriculum anymore, I just really want to make sure people know where their resources are to learn more about it. So once again, there's a job aid at cpsboard.org under resources and then technician resources where you can find uh, the steps in this is these are step by step still pictures of that process and you can print that out and have it at your stations just in case you see this issue. Uh, but I also um, felt that it would be really much more helpful to have an actual live sh demonstration posted so people could see how this is done and why it would be done. And so I did a video um, that is posted at my website, saferidenews.com, and you look under, um, under resources, it's under SRN video and visual tips. While you're there, I hope you check out all the other free resources that are there. But this is a video, I think it says that it's almost seven minutes long, but basically it's going to show you from the beginning to end exactly what to do to do uh, belt shortening. So if you're in an area where this happens a lot, or if you're in an area where you could possibly see it and, and need to know how to do it, or you're just in your curbside with somebody and you find yourself in need of doing it, this is a pretty a fairly quick thing you can go through and get a refresher on how to do belt shortening. Now I mentioned that the particular clip has to be used. Um, you can't just, even though the clip has an overall shape that looks a lot like a locking clip, it's very dangerous to try and use a locking clip, which will bend in a crash for the job of a belt shortener because that has to be a stronger metal alloy that's gonna hold using a particular threading uh, technique. And so um, I'll direct you to, on the latch manual on page 12, a part that people probably don't look at much, but there is actually a page about um, when you can't use the lower anchors, how to use seat belts. And so this is kind of almost like a, a little handout for car seat installation. And at the bottom corner of that uh, is, a, is information about the part numbers for certain brands that do still provide or have in the 
recent past made um, belt shortening clips. Now, just like everything else, the support for people with older cars is going away. They're figuring those are gone. So it's harder and harder to find these, but it's very helpful when you're trying to, to get the number, which you can find in the latch manual for the right part. For one thing, you can use that number to know, am I, is what I'm holding actually a, a belt shortener or a locking clip? This will help you know, but it also helps you in finding it. So most of these brands, you can check with their dealership to see if they might have that part. And again, having the number because their people at the desk are not probably going to know when you say belt shortening clip, they won't necessarily know what you mean. But if you have a part number, they can certainly look it up in their database. But I can tell you for Ford, they have put this out to a third party vendor Ford parts giant to be the one to distribute their, their part. And again, please, when you search there to try and find the part, which you can find, you can see it on this screenshot, uh, use the part number, because if you don't, uh, you can do what I did. I put in as close to a, you know, seat belt shortening clip for child car seat, and you're not going to get back anything close to that part. Um, these are all just seat belt parts and things. So you definitely want to have the right number. Also, we've been kind of dismayed. A few CPSTs in the country uh, contacted us to note that uh, while originally these prices were like $299 or something, they've really gone up. This is one of the cheaper ones I found uh, available. And so you want to, um, we're, we're kind of trying to look into why that <laughs> price has escalated to that extent. Because if you're already working with someone with a car that's older, what you don't want to do is ask them to have to pay um, a, a fair amount of money to get the clip they need to now use their car seat safely. And the reason I, another reason I make a big point of this is that if you just go and Google or use your whatever um, search engine to find belt shortening clip for car seat, you are not going to get an actual belt shortening clip. You're going to get a lot of other, you know, the regular locking clips. And so I, I worry about people in the general public trying to solve this problem without assistance from a CPST to know exactly what to do. Okay, so that is... Um, what we have in about seat belts, uh, all, there's all sorts of other little little uh, interesting things. But um, to to in the interest of time, we'll move on to talking about tethering, which I'll, I hope you all know is one of my most important and favorite things to discuss and urge people to do. And you're probably familiar with this drawing or one that's similar to it that kind of talks about the various places where a tether anchor could be. And this is kind of the listing that's pretty common. Um, and uh, but if you have if you've been tethering car seats lately, you probably noticed that a lot of these spots are not really seen as much anymore, starting with the one, the first one under the seat. Uh, but yes, actually, in some of the earliest cars that had factory installed tether anchors, uh, including this is my own 2001 Honda Odyssey, which I can guarantee you still could still runs and people would still be using it. A lot of minivans, especially with their captain's chairs, put the anchor on the bottom of the seat. And so on the left is the second row seat. And I was trying to put it to demonstrate tethering in it uh, not long ago. And I realized it's really, I had kind of almost forgotten, even though I use it for my own kids, where that anchor is. So I pulled it all the way out to take a picture. This is the seat removed and turned upside down. And you can see it doesn't look like our typical anchor and it is way, way underneath the seat. And there's a lot of other things if you're just digging around under there with your hand that you could get mis mis uh, mistaken. So just be aware that there in older cars, you might find anchors in a lot of different places because uh, one of the things I was noting in my new car trends, and I'm sure this isn't, you know, uh, a surprise to most of you, really what we've transitioned to now that we have stronger seat backs that can hold even in the center a lap shoulder belt, they've started to move the tether anchors to be much more likely to be on the seat back when you're in a in, in, in a vehicle that has a cargo space in the back, whether that's a minivan or an SUV or a hatchback. So the two areas of being on the filler panel, uh, meaning that little shelf behind the seat or on the seat back, um, other than pickup trucks, that's gonna be your, by and large, your most common place, certainly on new newly designed vehicles. Because, but in the past, you know, we had the vehicle seats weren't necessarily strong enough. And so they were given a lot of free reign as to where it could go. We do still see some up on the roof, 
but by and large, we don't see so many of the older ones. It gets so we you know we don't have as much practice in finding them. So I will um, note that another resource that's free at saferidenews.com is the Latch Gallery, and you can go under Tether Anchors and look up all the interesting places where Tether Anchors might be. That's one of the main things we're showing on that site. And um, this is just one example of one that's right over by the wheel well. That in this era it was labeled at least, but there were some that weren't. Uh, so it's just very different than where we um, normally would expect to see them nowadays. They're pretty much all over the place in those older ones. Okay, so for the last time we have uh, today, I want to talk more about retrofitting tether anchors. So as much as I love tethering, and I really encourage people to tether, uh, where I really want to be your cheerleader is on these older cars, because like I mentioned at the beginning, the one way we can keep a child forward facing as safe as possible is to tether the car seat. And if I can make an older car that's lacking all those new safety advances, much safer for a child by adding a tether anchor, that is a, not always an easy way, but once you get the part and you know where to put it, it's a pretty darn easy way and a cheap way actually to make that car much, much safer for that kiddo who has to ride in an older vehicle. And so if you've not ever thought of or touched or seen a, a retrofit tether, uh, they come in two different varieties in general. There's gonna be your various parts that's come in a kit and they're all different parts and you put them in. So you've got your basic pieces are gonna be a bolt and a nut. So this is your car's panel here. And so the bolt's going to go through uh, a, a bracket. This is, of course, where you put your, your tether hook. Uh, and then you're going to screw that in strongly with a bolt. And in between there, there are some important things like washers. And there's a spacer here to make sure it all sits up where it should. Uh, this is a spring washer that is a special kind of washer that because cars are gonna vibrate over time that can loosen up, but with this kind of washer, it's gonna stay in there tight. And then this little goopy looking thing is some, some gel that we're gonna put in there in certain situations where that happens to be where you could have, you don't want uh, you know uh, vapors to come into the, the passenger compartment. So you can see that it's nice when the, um, when the uh, car dealer can do this installation for you, but some cases it's all do it yourself. So at the right here is this is actually all these parts that were actually pre-assembled for you. And this part just screws into a pre-welded um, uh, nut that's already built into the car. So it looks like this in a lot of cars, especially sedans. Uh, you could see on the back panel, there are these little dots, which are little buttons. I always thought that was just holding the panel down. But in fact, what that is, is if you pry those up, and sometimes there's no little buttons, sometimes you have to cut the fabric, it's, there's no hole provided. But in any case, if you look underneath through the, um, through the trunk, this is showing holding a flashlight and kind of pointing with a, uh, a screwdriver. We're not actually screwing there. It's just actually pointing. But what we're pointing to is that there's this piece that looks like this. So in a lot of older sedans, if you look, there's going to be three of these parts with a plate that is making it strong. And it's a welded nut here uh, where you can just simply screw that part in at the top and you've got your um, into this part and then you've got your um, your tether anchor added in. Uh, in here's another one that's on the um, the back sill of a of a minivan. So you open up the back hatch, and here on the sill, uh, in this case, it shows that that there are factory installed ones. But in an older one, prying uh, this happens to be my car again. Pry off this little nubby thing, and you can kind of almost even make out here the threading here, right? So if I went to Honda, I could order the part number and screw it right in there to get a tether anchor put in for my, my van. So if you're trying to help families with retrofitting tether anchors, I strongly urge you to look in chapter six and the supplement to chapter six in the latch manual, because that's gonna help supply you with the part numbers and tell you more about their availability. Cause sadly, once these parts are all used up, they're not replenished. Um, and um, let you know if there is a free installation program uh, and other information. And so if you go through, it goes by manufacturer. And for instance, here, um, the, unfortunately, lately, the news isn't good because in, while it's still possible to retrofit in many cars, some cars we've run out of supplies. 
uh, and also we don't have that same support as we used to have for those older vehicles. So while the domestic automakers and Toyota and Lexus have had a free installation program uh, since ever since Latch came in, um, General Motors recently discontinued their free retrofit program. So it doesn't mean that you can't retrofit in their vehicles. It just means that for free, they don't have a program where they will re reimburse their uh, dealerships if they do an installation for free. So uh, that is a one ch bigger challenge that we have. But another huge challenge we have is, like I said, when those parts run out, they're no longer available. So here, for example, Mazda says that... Um, the parts are no longer available where for in the 2021 in the 2019 there was a table with the part numbers that you could get and since then they have come back and said no actually those are all gone so mazda does say though that a generic kit um, should not be used in their cars uh, because that would be your next thing would be say well if i can't use the one that that mazda made is it possible to use a generic kit um, in this case, Mazda says no, but other manufacturers say you can do that. And I'll note that uh, Mercury in the latch manual is going to have a table. It says right here, there'll be a table on the next page. And there are still parts available. But using a generic kit in certain cases is actually what they recommend that you do. So um, what is a generic kit? Well, basically, when tetherings first came about, when we were first uh, in the 90s, um, starting to gear up to have, um, to use tethers on car seats, the car seat companies would actually supply uh, a pre, uh, a generic kit that you could use in some cars. And so at first you could even get the car seat, it would come with it, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and over time, of course, the car seat companies, they don't provide those anymore. But some of the companies that have car seats for children with disabilities do uh, or have had tether kits and still do, but they don't call them generic anymore because they only want you to use them for your their own car seats, not for other um, brands' car seats. So in other words, over time, we don't have those generic tether anchor kits from reliable sources anymore, unless you're using one that comes from using a car seat from that actual company. And the reason that is a concern um, is that for these older vehicles, it could be quite tempting for them to go online and figure out another solution that is not reliable or not safe. Uh, and sad to say, these things are out there, these generic tether anchor kits that are not from a reliable source. This is just one picture. If you go Google this today, I've tried this several times over time. And every time I do, I get various versions of something like this. Um, or something different. But uh, one of the ways they do it is for seats where you can get between the bite. Um, you would slide this between the bite and this actually adds lower anchors as well as a tether anchor here. And um, it just holds in place by these two plates up against the seat back. So it's important to be wary of this. There's no such thing as a safe after, aftermarket latch system like this. That's that's not um, what should be done. And the thing that makes me nervous is not only does the do the car manufacturers say, oh dear, no, this isn't, you know, putting all the weight here and here for a car, child in a car seat is not how this seat back was designed to work. So this would not be a safe way. And I can also imagine that it would be quite easy to get a nice tight feeling installation using this device. So I could get a very false sense of security and for only say $20, I can buy this part and not realize it's quite unsafe. So be on the lookout for this sort of thing. Uh, I do have in the latch manual too at that first page of the supplement where um, this is in chapter six, that supplement for retrofitting with tether anchors. I added a little note here to warn about those and um, down here at the bottom, I do note that there is a list of retrofit tether anchor parts that includes the out of stock parts posted at saferidenews.com. So it's not in the latch manual, you can go to my website. And so in other words, in the latch manual, we've stripped out all the part numbers that are no longer available. Each time we update it, we ask the manufacturer, please tell us what's no longer available. We don't want to tell the public, here's your part number, and then expect them to go um, on a wild goose chase for something that's not available. So we strip it out of the latch manual, but 
because these parts can still be found on um, eBay, on other uh, used parts sites, uh, we want people to be able to tell if what they got is the right one. And so even though you're not getting it from the, the vehicle manufacturer, if you can get something in the bag and it has the part number on it, we want you to be able to go and look that up to make sure it actually matches. And so you can go to the saferidenews.com website. Katrina's kept that um, a nice list for um, posting there as well as other information, by the way, for do-it-yourselfers on retrofitting tether anchors. Okay, so there is a lot more that could be said about older vehicles, but those are the general categories that I hope kind of ring some bells to you and kind of help you think about what um, you want to be prepared for and how to be prepared when you do see these vehicles. Um, I mentioned resources already as I've gone along. There are a lot of them available, including the latch manual, um, Safe Ride New Support on the website, as well as the latch gallery. Um, and don't forget contacting me anytime you have a question. I'm definitely interested to hear what people come across, what kind of questions you have. Uh, all of that is um, useful for what I do to help all of you. And so if I can be of service to you while you help me learn what you're seeing out there, then that's a win-win. So Daniela, what do you have for any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, there are. You've had, um, you've had a, some that have come through and ironically, you answered some of them as they were coming through too. So it was like, perfect. Um, but you do have some, um, the first one comes from Candy. What were some pros and cons on the older passive restraint system? I'm assuming more cons since they are no longer in newer cars. Oh yeah, those the passive seat belts, I assume that's what she's talking about, the passive seat belts in the front seats. Um, I think most people would refer to those as a fail, right? That was a kind of a fiasco, as you can imagine. Um, people did not like having to duck into ones that were attached to the door. And usually they were removable, so you could unbuckle them and uh, put them aside. And so because they had that element of people being able to disable them, it kind of defeated the whole purpose. And even people who were trying to do it right frequently forgot if it was the type that was a shoulder belt separated from a lap belt, uh, they frequently forgot to, to put the lap belt on. And uh, when that, you know, of course, very unsafe to have just a shoulder belt, no lap belt. Um, also that when the lap belt was separate, um, of course you can't do any of them for car seats with their attached to the door, that's an absolute no. The ones we could work around a little bit when we had to, and that's usually if there was no back seat or a too small back seat, was if they had that separate lap belt, but often that was an ELR retractor on those. So we had to do belt shortening in that case. Uh, in a few, they finally got it, oh, people need to put a car seat in here. And so they actually did an ALR retractor maybe some switchable. So, um, so at least we could do that. But um, I pros and cons wise, I would say, and Daniela, you probably have some insights too from your, your automotive background, but I'd say that pretty universally considered a fail and a, a little chaotic situation. And um, I'm having a hard time even thinking of what a pro would be. <laughs> Yes, um, I am in agreement. <laughs> Everything you said. Um, okay, so the next question that comes from comes to us from Jen. When I teach about locking lap belts, I like uh, I liken them to a tilt lock on a tether adjuster or UAS mechanism. It's the same 30, 30 degree mechanism. Lots of light yeah. bulbs go off for folks when I make this comparison. So I guess that's Absolutely. that's more of a comment, right? Yeah, it's a good comment, and I do that too. What the tilt lock type of adjuster. And I, I usually kind of go the other direction, but you're right, Jen, people are more com comfortable and, and used to the tilt lock type um, of adjuster nowadays than they are even to the seatbelt. So yeah, putting it back in that direction makes good sense. The other thing that does though, is frequently we aren't thinking about whether it's in a locked or unlocked position on those. And I, I'll tell you what, in school bus, when you see those in various school bus restraints, uh, you do need to make sure that even the ones that are on the restraint itself are in a locked position. That's something that, uh, you know, you need to be thinking in terms of what's locking and if it's in a locked position. So thanks for that comment. And then Vanessa. Um, yeah, yeah. Vanessa, is there general guidance at what age seatbelts are considered expired and in need of replacement? 
So there are, uh, and you can chime in too, but there aren't really any expiration dates for seatbelts, but every seatbelt of course needs to be assessed for um, being in good condition. And over time, there's just chances that it's gonna get frayed or um, there's gonna be translucency or some sort of, a, you know, non-working part, it can get rusty. Um, so of course, any of those things need to be considered. And on a little bit of a, a side note on that even is the integrated car seat. Someone just asked me recently about an integrated car seat. I haven't seen those much lately, but coincidentally, I was asked about that same sort of thing. Those actually don't expire, but we sure know that webbing and metal parts and plastic parts do get damaged over time and do wear out. And so we wanna just look at that. We don't have a general guideline other than to check it for for safe, for safe how safe it looks. Okay, um, thank you. So there's another, um, another question from Lacey. She just wanted some clarification on the retrofitting. Whereas is it, is it you as in the tech does this for families or something we would talk about and teach the family? I yeah, it's, and that's what she was referring to. Right. I think the question is when I say what you ought to do and what we, you know, it, it, that's a great point because in most cases, what we want to do is lay out what the owner of the vehicle or the caregiver, whoever, uh, in this case, the owner of the vehicle say would do. And that's kind of up to you how much of that you want to do. I mean, I, I think generally speaking, we don't handhold too much, but it kind of depends on the situation, right? If they're in, you know, in a really dire straits and maybe don't have the wherewithal to get the part, we're probably going to step in and help a lot more along the way. And I've definitely talked to techs across the country who've really gone the extra mile trying to track down the parts on behalf of a caregiver. But really it is their responsibility and, and what is our responsibility it's to teach them, right? So I would definitely say every time you'd give them that part number, you would make sure you've written that down and they have it and you 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 know might even tell them, go to this dealership and ask for this, get back to me if you have problems and that kind of thing. But you know, you just had to take it time, uh, case by case how much you're gonna walk them through that uh, and how much handholding you'll do. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually due to time, uh, we're going to have to, we have a couple of wrap up slides as well. So for all of those that didn't get your questions answered, we will make sure that Denise has that, has, um, you know, access to that information and can hopefully reach out and help out um, at any point. Otherwise, you know where to find Denise, right? Safe Ride News or the Latch Manual. So, um, but so on... The webinar recording, it will be posted to the cpsboard.org slash forward slash recertification within one to two business days. As a reminder for the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one CEU. In order to earn the CEU, attendance on this webinar is required for 45 minutes. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a safe day and thank you for all of your life-saving education you provide.